Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. A very good morning to you uh, from a rather overcast and foggy County Galway, but we do hope you're keeping safe and well this morning. A reminder that this series uh, is brought to you by Chagask in collaboration with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, the National World Network and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. So today we turn our attention to soil fertility and how we refine fertilizer recommendations for more extensively managed grassland. And we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Suzanne Higgins from the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute in Northern Ireland, who will be speaking to us today about the Catchment Care Project. Good morning, Suzanne. You're very welcome to the Signpost series. Morning. Um, morning, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Um, happy to speak to you today. Great, great, to, great to have you today, uh, Suzanne. And Pass, good morning to you. You're good morning. Uh, the sunny southeast this morning. Yes, and it is nice and sunny. Uh, Suzanne, um, you're based up in uh, the north. Uh, could you tell us a bit about the work that you're doing in AFPI um, and uh, the maybe just an outline or an overview of the, the catchment care project? Yes, yeah, so I'm a soil scientist in AFPI in Northern Ireland. Um, so my expertise would be in soil fertility and farm nutrient management. So I, I work at the interface between production and the environment. So how can we optimize production but minimize any detrimental environmental effects? So today I'm talking about the Catchment Care Project, which is an interreg project. Um, and it's got um, it's working in three cross-border catchments between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Um, and it has a large number of partners. And I will be talking about the, the nutrient management component of catchment care. Great. Well, um, I think we will maybe ask you to go straight into sharing your screen because uh, we always find we run out of time for questions at the end. So it's nice to go straight straight into the presentation. OK, well, thank you very much for having me speaking today. Um, so the title of my talk is Refining Nutrient Management for Extensively Managed Grassland. This is part of the Catchment Care Project. I just want to acknowledge my co-authors, um, Gillian Nicholl, Russell Adams, Emma Hayes, Sarah Vero, and Donica Diddy. So I'm from AFBI in Northern Ireland. So we are a research institute and we have seven sites across Northern Ireland in case anybody isn't familiar with AFBI. And we do, we're mostly government funded, um, but we also do work for commercial companies and for um, um, different research funding streams. So um, we cover marine sciences, agriculture, food, veterinary sciences and plant sciences. We have a large research farm at Afby Hillsborough and we have a marine research vessel. And I work in the soil um, department in the agri-environment branch and I'm based in the headquarters in New Forge in Belfast. So my talk today, I'm going to be talking about water quality in Northern Ireland and in cross-border water bodies. Um, I'll be introducing what we mean by extensively managed grassland. I'll be talking about the loss of phosphorus from grassland soils and talking about the catchment care project and what we're doing there, looking at new fertilizer guidelines specifically for extensively managed systems. And finally, I'll be talking about ways that we can increase the precision of farm nutrient management. So in Northern Ireland, um, the Water Framework Directive is implemented through river basin management plans. So Northern Ireland shares three international river basin districts with the Republic of Ireland. So in this presentation, I will be focus on, focusing on the Blackwater subcatchment, and this is in the Naban um, International River Basin District shown on the map here, and it's in the border area of Tyrone, Armagh and Monaghan. So water bodies across Northern Ireland, um, rivers, lakes and groundwater are monitored continuously for chemical and ecological status. And this data is reported regularly to the Commission. So in recent years, unfortunately, there has been a, a slight deterioration in water quality. So in 2019, 44% of rivers had soluble reactive phosphorus classification of moderate or poor. And unfortunately, this is a decline on the 2012 to 2015 value of 34%. 
And so nearly a third of the sites monitored have deteriorated by one class for the Water Framework Directive Soluble Reactive P status. So we want to see um, how we can better manage the, the losses and the phosphorus getting into our rivers. So agriculture land is an important point and diffuse source of, of phosphorus into waterways. So there was a recently a large soil sampling scheme across Northern Ireland in 2017-2018, and this showed that 50% of soils in Northern Ireland contained high or surplus levels of soil pea. And this, by this we mean that the soil pea is above what is actually required for agronomic production. And whenever there's high soil pea levels like this, um, shown by the orange and the red colours on this map, there's increased risk of pea loss from these soils. And it's estimated that nine, there's 940 tonnes of agricultural pea lost into water bodies per year in Northern Ireland. So the um, high soil phosphorus levels arise because historically too much phosphorus essentially is being applied for this, to the soils. And this is above what is actually required for production. And it's through um, just continual high um, slurry applications and chemical fertilizer. And the risk of, of pea loss from agriculture soils, it varies depending on, on the conditions of the soil. It's for example, wetness and slope. And there are a number of um, the nutrient action program. It, it implements certain measures that, that are put in place to try and minimize um, not nutrient and phosphorus loss from agriculture land. So for example, the close period, and this has been actually very effective at reducing soluble reactive um, P loss. So the work that Donica Duty has been doing in AFB has shown that the close period has reduced the loss of soluble reactive P by 39%. So the close period has actually been a very effective measure. And one of the issues is our, our high rainfall climate. So parts of Northern Ireland, particularly in the West, are getting up to 2000 millimetres of rainfall annually. And this creates soils that are saturated. So the orange colours in this map, we would have areas of land which are saturated or above field capacity for over 250 days of the year. So it's, it's an astonishing figure to tell people outside of Northern Ireland and Ireland um, how wet our soils are, but um, this is the reality of, of what we're trying to manage. And so um, Donica has also, his group have also done a lot of work classifying um, runoff risk potential in Northern Ireland and 58% of, of land would be classed as having a high runoff potential um, risk of runoff shown by the, the red colours on this map. I'm just going to show a video now, hopefully it'll work. And this is of a storm event. So these storm events occur maybe once or twice a year, and unfortunately they're becoming more frequent. And these events are one of the, the causes of phosphorus loss into our waterways. So these events maybe call, um, occur once or twice a year, but they can carry, we just get continual heavy rainfall for, for 24 hours or more, and um, the, the soil has just become flooded, and that in that field there, that is normally just a very small stream, and it just develops into, you can see there's quite a powerful flow, um, carries a lot of soil and sediment from fields, and unfortunately storm events are becoming more frequent. We also get loss of where cattle are poaching by riverbanks and there are also some loss from farmyards so if anybody heard Sarah Vero's talk earlier in August Sarah did a very good talk on nutrient loss from farmyards and this was also part of the catchment care project. So catchment care is an EU funded project it aims to improve fresh water quality in the northwestern and Naban international river basins. So the, the project is focused on the cross-border catchments of the Blackwater, the Finn and the Arnie. Um, and today I'll mostly be talking about the nutrient work in the Blackwater. So the aims of catchment care are to develop a number of water quality improvement projects, such as the installation of groundwater monitoring stations across the region. So there are quite a large number of project partners. So Donegal County Council are the lead partner. Then we have ourselves at AFB, Inland Fisheries Ireland, the Locks Agency, Ulster University, Armagh City, Banbridge and Craig Avon Borough Councils, the British Geological Survey and Geological Survey in Ireland. 
Um, it is an EU interreg funded pro um, programme. So the budget is over 13 million, and we also have received some match funding of 2 million provided by uh, local government departments. So the project actions, we through Cashman Care, we want to achieve a measurable impact on water quality. And this needs to be transferable beyond those three catchments of the Blackwater, the Arnie and the Finn. And we want to contribute to a project legacy. Um, so I'm leading on the nutrient management component of catchment care. And I just want to um, acknowledge Gillian Nichols' work here. She, Gillian does a lot of the day-to-day -day work with farmers and, and managing the, the farm trials that we have. So what we're trying to do is identify strategies to manage phosphorus inputs at a farm scale and an individual field level. We essentially want to reduce the number of fields which are oversupplied with P and develop an evidence base then that will help shape future regulations in relation to soil nutrient management. And we really want to um, important to develop recommendations that are appropriate for cross-border farms. So um, part of the project is re-evaluating current fertilizer recommendations. So current fertilizer recommendations favor high production systems. So this would be grass and receiving high nitrogen inputs. So for example, a derogated farm where there'd be fertilizer and manure of over 300 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. And these farms would have high target yields. So they're aiming for 12 to 16 tonnes of dry matter per hectare per year, and they'd be maybe taking three silage cuts. But however, a lot of Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland isn't operating at this intensity. So extensively managed livestock farms in Northern Ireland, um, they would have total fertilizer inputs of less than 60 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. So a lot lower amount of fertilizer being applied and the manure would be less than 120 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. So the yields of these farms would be four to seven tons of dry matter per hectare per year. And that is actually their target yield. So those farms, um, they might only be taking one or two silage cuts. And a lot of the farmers there maybe be part-time farmers. So they're not a big high intensity dairy system where you're aiming for the top yields they're, they're working on a, a lot lower intensity of farming. So this is a landscape that, that comprises a large portion of the land area of Northern Ireland and Ireland. Um, but there's currently minimal published data assessing what exactly are the P requirements of these lower input systems, particularly our lower nitrogen input system. And because of the large land area that these um, extensive grasslands cover, Oh, if you over apply P to these grasslands, they could be making a significant contribution to the, the overall P loss into our waterways. So instead of always focusing on the most intense farms, the dairy systems, it's very important to look at these more extensively managed systems and look at the contribution they make to water quality. So um, in terms of grass yield, so grass yield would be limited the maximum yield would be determined by the most limiting nutrient. So in an extensively managed system, the lower nitrogen, the, the nitrogen rate is the limiting factor. So they're putting on a lower amount of nitrogen. So the maximum yield they are attaining is seven tons per hectare um, of dry matter per year. So if they're putting on more nitrogen, obviously you could increase the yields. Um, but because they're putting on lower nitrogen, even if they put on more phosphorus, their yield won't increase because the overall system is limited by the nitrogen supply. Um, so where the nitrogen input is low, the phosphorus uptake by the grass and also the phosphorus requirement will be lower. So an extensive farmer using 60 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, um, could, we are asking then, could they have a lower amount of phosphorus overall in their soil and still say an index one in the, the Olsen system in Northern Ireland? So could they have a lower, operate at a lower soil phosphorus content and still achieve their, their maximum yields att uh, um, attainable? Whereas for a higher nitrogen system, a big dairy farm, um, they would need, because they are putting on more nitrogen, taking off more grass cuts, they would actually need more phosphorus in there in the soil. So the upper end of index two would be, would be essential for a more intense farmer. So in the catchment care project, then we're looking at the overall levels of legacy P in the soil. So this is the amount of P 
um, on farms across um, the catchment. And this is where too much phosphorus has been applied over the years. And we're trying to refine the advice that we're given to these farmers. And we're, we're specific, farm specific advice. So we're looking at each individual farm and, and looking at um, the you know whether they're grazing or silage how many fields they're cutting for silage and, and what nutrients they're putting on and we selected 17 farms in the blackwater catchment so we we have a good mix of farms in tyrone armagh and monaghan so the blackwater catchment it's it's 1500 um kilometer square in the naban international river basin district between tyrone armagh and monaghan so 90% of the land use in the Blackwater is agriculture, so a mix of dairy, beef and sheep. The geology would be Carboniferous limestone or sandstone, um, with limestone, shale and mudstone overlain by proglacial boulder clay. So the soils in the Blackwater would be poorly draining and there'd be a seasonally perched water table and this promotes saturation excess runoff. So this area has high winter rainfall, so it's a high runoff runoff risk from these soils and the soils would have low um, storage capacity for, for water and poor permeability. So these factors all elevate the risk of diffuse pollution from, from these farms. So the, there are two components to the project. So we're mapping the soil pea on all the 17 farms and then we're preparing nutrient management plans for those farmers. And then another part of the, of the, the work is evaluating new um, P recommendations for extensively managed systems. Um, and these have been introduced recently into the, the new update of the Nitrates Action Programme. So in um, January to March 2019, the 17 farms were soil sampled. So we sampled 400 fields in total. And we found that 66% of fields in the Blackwater catchment contained above the agronomic um, optimum for phosphorus. So this is anything to the, the red, to the right of the red line on this graph. So, and this is higher than the national average. So Northern Ireland as a whole, uh, as a whole, 50% of fields overall would be too much phosphorus. And this particular catchment, there's 66% of fields. So this catchment particularly um, has cases of too much phosphorus in the fields. So what we have done is produce nutrient management plans for each of the farmers. So we've color coded their fields. So if the fields um, colored red, that would mean there's too much phosphorus in the soil there. So it would be an index three or above. And we would say, do not apply any more phosphorus to the fields colored red. Then if it's green, it means that's the optimum soil phosphorus content. And there would be a fertilizer recommendation for those fields. And if it's yellow, um, there'd be below optimum. So there'd be a fertilizer recommendation for those fields. And we have found that this, um, we're also calculating farm pea balances. So the farmers fill in diaries and we give them recommendations then for their, their nutrient applications. And we have found these maps and the one-to-one -one advice to farmers has been really, really effective. So in response to these plans, we have had a 42% reduction in the phosphorus applied through inorganic fertilizer. So it's very often the case that farmers aren't aware of the phosphorus content of their fields and maybe aren't soil testing often enough, or they just maybe don't see, receive the specific advice um, that, that would help manage nutrients more effectively. And as a reassurance to the farmer, so if you tell a farmer to not to apply any more phosphorus, there might be concern in case deficiencies arise. So we're also sampling the grass in the fields and that'll show us the phosphorus content of the grass and um, reassure the farmer there's no, the phosphorus is, or the grass is getting enough phosphorus from the stores from the soil and they don't need to apply any more. So now in terms of evaluating the new um, fertilizer recommendations. So this is based on the, the lower nitrogen inputs to these systems. And it was included in the revision of the Nitrates Action Programme in 2019 to 2022. So as in, in a way of trying to reduce the surplus of pea on extensive farms, these new fertilizer recommendations were put in place. So um, in Northern Ireland, we work with on the UK um, 
um, fertilizer um, recommendation system using the Olson P soil test, whereas in the Republic you um, use the, the Morgan P soil test. Um, and both similar would be we both these would be divided into an index system. So in the Olson index, it would go from a zero, which means if you have a zero, it means your soil is deficient in phosphorus, right up to an index four, which would indicate that the soil is excessive in phosphorus. And you um, previously it was just a one band for an index two, which would be the optimum soil P content. And part of the new recommendations, we have divided the index two into a two minus and a two plus. So what we're thinking is that the the two minus would be more suitable for an, an extensively managed farmer. So it's at the lower end of index two, whereas um, a more intensive farm could operate at the, the upper end of index two. And this um, it, it's similar to the, the Morgan index where you have um, an index one to a four where a, a one would be low and a four would be high in phosphorus. So we're very aware that there's these two soil tests operating in very close proximity in border areas. And where we, um, this is something we, we've been looking at in the Catch One Care project on Cerebera, we have just, um, submitted a paper looking at this, looking at, so what are the differences between the Olson and the Morgan test? And so a farmer, depending on where their farm is located and what soil test they do, does that mean if they use one of the particular tests, if they use the Olson test and it comes out an index three and they're told not to apply phosphorus, whereas if they had got their soil tested using the Morgan's test and it was an index um, one or two and they could apply phosphorus. So this is what we were asking, would there be differences in phosphorus recommendations depending on what test was done? So we did get a very good correlation between um, the Olson and Morgan. And we're also looking at um, water extractable P in that as a, a kind of the relationship with water extractable P2 to see um, which test correlates correlates well with um, the water extractable P. So this is in a, in a paper that we're, we're just, um, it'll soon be published. So the new fertilizer recommendations. So the new fertilizer for extensively managed grasses. So the index two um, has been split into a two minus and a two plus. And then we have new fertilizer recommendations for grazed land and silage land. And we're testing these. Um, in the catchment care project to see if these are they are appropriate. So we had trials on we have trials on three farms. So we have a farm in Monaghan, um, and then we have one in Clogher and one in Ben Burb, and we have sixty plots on each of these farms where we're putting on different rates of P, and then we have we're putting on the amount of nitrogen that that farmer is using currently. So it's usually around 60 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. And then we're looking at the differences in yield with differences in phosphorus applied. And we're looking at the grass quality as well. So this is a typical, this would be a typical extensively managed field. So this site is in Monaghan and you can see the field's quite wet. It'd be due just used for, for grazing generally. And there it is quite wet. You can see rushes in the field. Um, and this would be a typical extensively managed site. Then we have a site in Clogher, which is also used for grazing. Um, and you can see that with the different rates of, of pea applied, um, our yields for the two cuts. So we have data for 2021, which we're just um, looking at at the moment. So we're still getting, we're getting yields over around seven tonnes per hectare, even with the different rates of, of P applied. Um, and these are what the farmer, these are good yields for these farms. And you can see that even when no P is applied, there's plots getting no P, they were still getting over six tonne of dry matter per hectare per year. So even when no P is applied and that site is an index two minus, so even that site with no P applied still was getting over six ton a hectare um, of dry matter in the year from the two cuts. And then the third site we have is a silage site. So this site was getting more nitrogen. So the recommendations would be that if you're cutting the land for silage, you can put on more nitrogen. Those farmers would put more nitrogen on their silage fields. 
and then they can get um, there's a recommendation then for slightly more phosphorus to a silage field to make sure it gets enough phosphorus for, for a silage system. And at this particular site, it was interesting because um, it was very deficient in, in potassium. And, you know, so the thing is, we are always focusing on nitrogen and, and phosphorus, but really um, things like potassium, soil pH, these are equally important. And by just improve, correcting that, night, that potassium deficiency at this site, it greatly improved the yield. So we always have to remember it's an overall nutrient balance and keep an eye on soil pH as well. Um, that it's really important to, to optimize production at these sites. So it's not always a case of having to increase nitrogen or, or phosphorus. It's, it's things like potassium, sulfur, soil pH that need to be all corrected to, to optimize yields. So um, in terms of the new recommendations, we didn't find any deficiency in any of the plots. So the grass was getting enough phosphorus on the new recommendations for a grazing and a silage system. We did see some signs of deficiency on um, the plot, the control plots, which got no phosphorus. So it's really important um, that some phosphorus is needed if the soil P is low. So these sites were um, at the lower end of the pea content in terms of soil pea content. So they do need phosphorus. So we're not giving the message that no phosphorus, you don't need to apply phosphorus. If you have a low soil pea index, you need to apply phosphorus because um, otherwise there potentially could get deficiencies, but it's getting the, the amount right. So only putting on what you need and, and not going above that. And there's some, been some very good, um, some literature, recent literature from Belgium, and it's looking at the, the soil um, pea balance and looking at um, the, the higher the nitrogen input, the greater the growth and the demand for pea. So this, this other work in the literature is supporting what, the work that we, the results that we're finding, and pea deficiency would tend to be more common in a high nitrogen input system. So, um, in catchment care, what we're trying to do is reduce the overall um, legacy P across the catchment. So those soils which are index three and above, which are very high in P. So we want eventually those fields to get down to an index two or perhaps an index one if it's a grazed field. Um, and this can take a very long time. So previous studies, um, some work that John Bailey did from AFB demonstrated that it can take up to 13 years for an index four soil to reduce to an index two. So again, this comes in with the amount of nitrogen applied. So for a grazing system, um, no, if no more pay is applied, it can take the 13 years to reduce. But if you have a silage system where you're putting on more nitrogen, the phosphorus in the soil can decline quicker. Um, and this would be took eight years to reduce from an index four to an index of two. So what we want to do, if we're telling farmers not to apply any more pay, we, we just were very conscious of um, the, make sure the grass gets enough pay um, at times of, of rapid growth. So this can happen in the springtime, whenever the grass suddenly grows very quickly, the soil warms up and there's a big spurt of growth in the, in the spring. So there's actually only a small amount of, of phosphorus in the soil solution. And that's why we put on our fertilizer. So you, you put on fertilizer to make sure there's enough readily available pea for growth. So if we stop applying pea, then the soil is, is the grass is relying more on the so the peas stored in the soil, and we were looking um, to see well is there enough readily available pea there if you're not putting on pea through slurry and, and fertilizer, and um, we have some pot trials at AFB looking at things like that at the moment. So we're conscious of if you tell farmers not to apply any more pea to make sure that the, there's enough readily available pea in the soil for times where there's rapid growth. So the final thing I'm going to talk about this morning is targeted um, management in fields and new technology. So generally we manage our fields as uniform units. So we sample a field and it just by um, a bulk soil sample and it just gets one uh, nutrient value for that field and then fertilizer and slurry is blanket applied. But there's been quite a lot of research. We've done a lot of research in this in AFB showing that there's there's um, substantial variability in fields, in nutrients and soil pH. So 
it would be beneficial to manage field as, fields at a subfield scale, but this is obviously very costly um, and it wouldn't be practical to implement this widely. But there's a lot of new technology developing all the time that is going to present us with opportunities in the future for, for managing our fields. So I have a PhD student at the moment, Emma Hayes, who's doing some excellent work on mapping nutrients at a subfield scale. And um, Emma has been um, sampling fields on a grid basis and then mapping the nutrients. So this is an example of, of phosphorus here in a field. And you can see the bottom of this field is deficient in phosphorus, whereas the top right corner in the dark red, um, that is index four for phosphorus. So you can see that really the farmer would only need to put on phosphorus to half this field. The right hand side of that field doesn't actually need phosphorus. So if you saw a test at that in normal ways, you, the field would probably come out as an index two and a uniform application would be applied, but really the left hand side at the bottom of that field needs more phosphorus than that. And you could really avoid putting on any slurry or fertilizer on the right hand side. So all most fields are like this, that there's huge variability, but we we usually don't see it because we're not sampling at this kind of intensity, but it could improve management because we know there are hot spots of phosphorus within fields. And these are the sites where they're at risk of being point sources from a field of phosphorus loss. So you can see in this field, the very dark colors, the red there, that is um, a hot spot of phosphorus in that field. And then another part of the work that Emma's doing is um, she's developing models looking at runoff and she's using LIDAR and drones to, to look at runoff pathways and see how they are connected to those hotspots and identify the risk from hotspots in, in um, fields for nutrient loss. So this is, a, I think, in future to help improve our water quality and reduce um, runoff P from soil and loss of P from soil, we, we kind of need to improve the way we're managing our fields. Um, so in conclusion then, farm-specific nutrient management is, is essential for reducing nutrient surpluses. And we really need to look at field-scale nutrient management plans. And they're, they're very effective communication tools and farmers respond very well to a, a map of their, their farm showing where they should and where they shouldn't apply nutrients. And um, what we, we think that the extensively managed grassland it can still operate and, and be productive at a lower P input and a lower soil P level than, than's currently the case. So I just want to thank everybody for listening and um, Catchment Care is um, it's in its, its final couple of years now and we're very grateful to the farmers that have been involved in Catchment Care and the cooperation and participation of farmers in, in this work. So thank you very much for listening. Um, thank you, Suzanne. Um, really enjoy that presentation and, and particularly the graphics that you had there showing the that uh, preferential flow within fields. It, it really is. Uh, it's quite when you look at, at a field level, really, we, we need to, I suppose we need to be getting down to below field level. In, yep. in practice, though, uh, how do you see us being able to do that, um, given that you, you probably need to take an individual sample for each part of the, those fields. Um, is there technology out there that, that can help us do that? Um, at the moment, there's not. So there are, I know um, there are soil sensors being developed, which we hope could do real, actual real time measures of nutrients across a field but we're not quite there yet in terms of that technology being ready and available so it's still um the physical way physical method of going taking a sample from the field and, and analyzing it in the lab which is very expensive takes a lot of time but the good thing about soil sampling is and phosphorus you only need to soil sample every three or four, maybe five years, and that phos that will give you a good measure of your phosphorus, and you don't need to um, sample then for another three or four years. So you could actually do this, um, if but what we think is it'd be the fields most at risk. So if, if you have a field beside a river, it's a slope, it's a field that gets very wet, those are the fields which would be at risk. So this is maybe targeted at certain fields which you think 
um, could be particularly vulnerable for, for pay loss in the waterway. So you wouldn't need to do this across a whole farm. Um, it would be just certain fields, maybe at most at risk of pay loss. If, if, uh, we had a question there in relation to the nitrates directive. Um, what is the position with the directive now that uh, Northern Ireland will be leaving the European Union? Um, well, we are. We still are complying with all the regulations. So, and we still have to. Um, it's the process is still the same at the moment, but we're just. Yeah, we're we're still complying with all the the procedures and reporting on our water quality and so I'm not sure what way it'll be in the future there'll obviously be a UK um a similar UK yeah. position yeah. on this yeah it'll be interesting how, how that develops yeah. uh past some some very good technical yeah. questions coming in here for Suzanne yeah um, I suppose the, the, the a lot of questions around the comparison between systems in Northern Ireland and Ireland and uh, uh causing that's causing a, a lot of confusion as I think it, it, it always does um, one here, just uh, in relation to limits, and uh, just from Tom O'Dwyer, says it appears that Northern Ireland nitrates limits are lower uh, uh, for lower fertilizer P than recommended uh, in the Republic. Uh, is that the case? I would have thought it was the other way around. I thought ours were, were a little bit more uh, restrictive than yours. No, I could be wrong on that. I think they are slightly more restrictive in the North. Um... And while we have that, we still go by our index system. It's the way the, so we still have, if it's an index three or above, you shouldn't apply any more phosphorus to the soil. And that'll be a similar, it's the index operates in the south in a similar way, but the, because it's measured by a different soil test, the actual soil P values are different because it's a different test that's used. Yeah, and, and it's, it's not helped by the fact that we use a different uh, uh, no. uh, definition of, of uh, phosphorus as well. Uh, so <laughs> the, the, the compound, you use the kilograms of compound and we use kilograms. Yes, we, of yeah, we do phosphate. So yeah. it'll be based on phosphate. Where, so we did, we do realize that because working with those farmers, we always had to convert, we converted it to P and give our recommendations in, in, in P rather than P205. Um, so there are the way there are differences between <laughs> it's difficult Did you, yeah. a, a question there relating to some recent reports from northern ireland in terms of the amount of organic pea being produced uh and the difficulty th that the uh that that level of organic pea is going to to mean for actually trying to get a reduction in soil pea levels just to to, to have enough land to, to spread it Yes, so we do have a surplus of, of organic manure produced. So we're trying to think, we, we're doing a lot of work on um, slurry separation, ways of reducing the piquant of, content of slurry. And um, we're looking at yet yeah, how we can manage it. Can we move that more to arable land? And we're, we're talking about different ways of managing that phosphorus, even like pelletizing the, the you know, um, Slurry, different thing. We're looking at different, a lot of different things at the moment to try and try and um, deal with that issue. But we do have a surplus of slurry, a surplus of pee. Okay. Question there in terms of a, a view on which is the most appropriate uh, uh, um, soil pee uh, test to use. Uh, I suppose, given the, the information you're, you're, you're trying to, to get from the soil pee test, which relate both to uh, uh, or, uh, um, agronomic productive capacity and risk for loss? Well, the conclusion we've come to, there is no ideal soil test. So the problem is that our soils, we have so many soil types across Ireland. So those soil, the soil test mightn't work the same. It, it depends on soil type. So you could even in, um, even in Northern Ireland or even in the Republic, depending where, what soil type you test, how effective that soil test is in extracting the plant available pea. So those soil tests are a measure of plant available pea um, and they're they're based on agronomic trials. So what, what it's telling you how much phosphorus is available there for growth. That's what those soil tests are based on. So historically, the UK has found that the Olsen test gives the better measure of of plant available pea, whereas at some point in the past, 
in the, the south, the Morgan's pea was seen to be um, a more effective measure, depending on the soil types in the south, the most effective measure of, of plant available pea. Um, but we find neither test is likely to be, we, you know, is, is better than the other. And um, it, it depends on, on soil type. And we found, we also looked at water extractable pea. So um, let me just check my, so there was a better relationship between the Morgan pea and the water extractable pea. So possibly the Morgan is, is might be a better test of um, maybe environmental risk. Whereas the, um, the Olsen test give, was saying there was less plant available pea. So, um, so the the Olsen test then would imply that um oh no I've got myself confused now but um yeah there's differences in between the two tests and yeah. water extractable pea yeah. and yeah it's, one it's, is more environmentally yeah. focused yeah, yeah. And, and production than the uh, more so on the the Morgan's uh, I think is is that the, it's, it's, it's not surprising it's a, it's a confusing area there, there, there was um, a comment there that uh, the, the map you showed is is very typical of what uh, has been observed down here that you have a lot of high peas around the farmyard and yes. as you move further away that that's uh, uh, that that that's uh, and one of the jobs is to try and get a, a more uh, extensive uh, spreading of or a, a longer distance spreading of, of some of the, the nutrient is that yes. a part of your advice Yes, so this is what we're advising to, to not always, yeah, there's a tendency to go to the easiest fields, the most accessible fields all the time, and they tend to be around the farmyard, they would tend to get more slurry applied, more fertilizer applied. So we're advising that the slurry and fertilizer be distributed more evenly across the farm. So you're going to the fields furthest away or looking at your nutrient plan. So we would be advising that farm nutrient plan, those fields are lower in P, so put more pea on those fields, take it away from the, the high pea fields. But as in the catchment care project, you could see for some of those photographs there, some of those extensive fields are so wet, they could be in a difficult position. So it's not always easy to put nutrients on some of those fields. They, um, it's harder to get tractors in and out of them and they, they're just wet for a longer time period of the year. So there are reasons why certain fields get more slurry than others and unfortunately it's very difficult to manage landscape factors like that um, there's a, another question there it, regarding the identification of critical source areas and to what degree are you putting in uh, alternative uh, management practices in the the in these areas that are, are at really high risk yeah so um where the, where we have identified using the LIDAR runoff pathways, using LIDAR or, or other modeling methods where we've identified they're the biggest, the greatest risk of runoff. And then we would be saying then, particularly, it would be particularly in when the soil is wet after um, rainfall events and related to the soil pea content to keep away from those areas in particular when you're applying slurry so we can highlight to a farmer in a particular field a part of a field that's the most risk of, of runoff so if it's if it's very wet if it's um you know to, to keep away at certain times of the year avoid applying phosphorus at certain times there's also a question um suzanne around you know Taking taking a plug of soil on its own and, and testing it using those tests, should we be taking into account more the, the soil type uh, as part of our recommendations to farmers? Um, that, that's something that has been a long going discussion here in Ireland. Um, in terms of the tests used, you mean? In or terms of the test in isolation of uh, really fully understanding the soil type within the field. Yeah, so that's why we're the, that gridded sampling and mapping the distribution across the fields is really important. So you're not assuming the whole field is uniform and the same because a field won't be. And that's that's the reason why you would isolate samples in parts of the field and, and sample them separately and get a separate value and then map your field. So that's ideally that's the way it should be done um, to manage phosphorus effectively. But as I've sort of said, it's, it's not really practical to do that, but mm. ideally that's where we should. Um, another thing in terms of soil tests and, and different soil types. So we know in Northern Ireland, the basalt region 
uh, covers a large part of County Antrim. Um, it is a very different soil type and the Olsen test works differently in the basalt soils. So part of what we're just about to start is um, a piece of work looking at different soil tests specifically on the basalt soil. So we know that the Olsen test um, works differently on it compared to other soils. So it's, it's important to go in and look for possibly having different tests in different regions. So this is the route we're going down at the moment to see whether a basalt, basalt region um, does it need a different soil test to properly define the amount of plant available P. And then the risk there of obviously P loss into waterways could be different. In terms of, of communicating the results of those soil tests then to farmers, um, do all farmers have a nutrient management plan in the north or what, what, uh, what level of, uh, uh, how, how, um, how, how are they obliged to have a, a full nutrient management plan completed for the farms? Um, no, because as part of the nitrous action program, they have to prove that they need phosphorus. So they they need a person um, for derogation, for example, they by law, they can only apply phosphorus if, they, if there's a need for it. So if it's index below index three, so they have to prove by a soil test result that they can put on, that's on derogated farms as part of the derogation. But for the rest of Northern Ireland, there aren't those same exact same rules so a lot of farmers aren't soil testing regularly so there's a value of like six percent of only about six percent of farmers actually soil test regularly in northern ireland and it'll be um farmers attached to maybe there's there's farmers involved in advisory groups with our CAFRI, which is um our advisory service and um those farmers involved in the kind of advisory schemes, they would they would get soil sampling through that if they're involved in a group. But there's a lot of farmers out there not attached to any groups and don't get involved in kind of um discussion forums and things. So they they're not obliged to soil sample unless they want to be a derogated farm. So we have found that yeah, there's huge um yeah, there's not enough soil sampling going on, but this is why we had that big soil sampling scheme a few years ago. And going forward, the, there's hopefully going to be another big version of a soil sampling scheme where we sample the whole of Northern Ireland and the department funds that because that's the only way we're going to get a measure of, of a true measure of nutrient content of fields um, because farmers don't routinely do it themselves often enough. A question there in relation to the timing of, of P to get the balance for, again, for agronomic and, and, and risk uh, as to, and, and whether or not there are differences in the recommendations for timing and, and uh, uh, splitting of, of P application across the year for different soil types. Um, yeah, so we just, we normally just soil sample, it'll be done in the closed period, but um, there is a recommendation for that. Some of the fields you can, if you're index um, three, you can have a early application of P. That is a small amount goes in for that spring growth, but then no more applied for the rest of the season. So it's particularly that that springtime where the growth suddenly takes off. And that's where we're concerned about enough plant available P in the soil and um, in the soil solution in particular in spring. Um, because that's when the grass needs to be able to take it up mm. rapidly. Okay. There's been many uh, a, a heated meeting here in the, in the south about the, the calendar dates around uh, spreading. And you showed a slide there about work that uh, Donica Doody had done, I think. Uh, could you maybe expand on that for us? Yeah, so Donica Doody, he, um, because we have continual monitoring stations, we have a few um, stations in Northern Ireland which are continuously monitoring water quality. And um, we were looking at the soluble reactive P with a closed period and then without a closed period. So the difference then that closed period and the dates of it, um, the impact that makes. So we have that monitored over a number of years. Um, soluble reactive P in water in relation to closed period and how the closed period reduced the amount of P in the waterways. But then Donica has done modeling work um, using the surface model and it was showing if you move the dates of the closed period. So if you move the closed period, it said ended in January. 
what difference that would make to water quality. And then he's also modeled, well, what happened if you extended the close period? So he has, now I can't give you all the details of that, but I know this is some of the, the work that he's doing about moving the dates of the close period and the impact of it. So maybe we'll have Donica at some stage to to, to give us a, a lowdown on that. Yeah. I'm sure there'll be many interested parties <laughs> in, in that particular one because it is a source of frustration for farmers uh, where you know they see a fine day and uh, yes. you're within the close period and, and you can understand uh, that frustration. Um, uh, question here about how, uh, how did you get those farmers with low engagement to get involved in soil, the soil sampling scheme? Um, it was essentially so this is where Gillian Nickel on the project and um, her job was to connect with those farmers and, and so it was basically going to the door and just talking to them and saying look we have a project here now those farmers didn't receive any payments or anything from the part they they received a nutrient manager plan they they're very all we had really high uptake so a lot of farmers we find are willing to engage, especially in you know border areas, and um, the west of Northern Ireland. You know, kind of those areas that are further away. Um, a lot of them are, are are happy to get involved in things we find, but it takes that getting a relationship with the farmers. Sort of, it's basic going out, knocking on the door, and talking to them, and then yeah, we're very very grateful for the, those farmers that have been in catchment care and. They've let us use their fields for three years. We're going to soil sample now um, in the coming winter, retest all the 400 fields and see, because we've had a 42% reduction in the phosphorus use, we're going to see well, what has the soil level um, P reduced and um, yeah, just to carry on the work that way with the one-to-one -one advice and giving them a nutrient plan. And just to That's follow up to that, is that, is that in specific catchments or across all of Northern Ireland? Um, very um, resource no, intensive is the, the comment. That's, yeah, that's just the catchment care project, and we only have done 17 farms. So, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of farmers that aren't involved in it. It's just that's the amount we could handle because that's part, just part of the project. Now, I know the big soil sampling scheme, the one in 2017, 2018, where we sampled, um, now let me think it was 12,000 fields. And those farmers did receive a nutrient plan, but we had a lot of advice, um, input from CAFRI, our advisory service. We had to bring them in because um, to then work with the farmers, so they all got a nutrient plan and they got training in interpreting that nutrient plan. So you, you do need that one to, because farmers a lot of the time get their soil results. They don't know what they mean. So um, we had training programs for the farmers to interpret their soil results, and we had then CAFRI advisors come in to, to work with the farmers in, in that case. A, a question there in relation to, I suppose, the, the, the more species rich and, and uh, low intensity, uh, were there, uh, was there a focus on some of these type of farms in the, in the project and, and uh, what level of fertilizer then is being uh, uh, recommended on those. Um, so we did we didn't um, differentiate between on we didn't look at species. Then we we noticed on the farm there's more species rich grasslands on these farms. So they're, they're less because there's lower amount of nitrogen put on. They're naturally sort of tend to be more species rich and a lot of nice biodiversity on these farms. We didn't alter the recommendations based on anything like that. But it was we have noticed that and. I think going forward, it's some of the research is kind of gearing towards looking at these more species rich grassland and looking at the impact of that on nutrient requirements. Okay, and a related question uh, on, on extremely low input systems, mycorrhizal fungi, fungi uh, could play a role in, in pea availability. Is there any work uh, done on that or that you might be aware of? Um, yes, I know that Dario Fanara in FB, he does a lot of work on that. He has um, on our long term slurry project at Hillsborough, where there's um, over 50 years, 50 years of slurry applications to grassland and plots which have no slurry applications. He has looked at that, the different in the increases in the mycorrhizal fungi, where there are lower amounts of pea applied. So Dario has produced papers on that they're published um so he would be the person to but i know he has published on that 
Yeah, and there's there, there there's a, a few comments that we probably should be cooperating a bit more north and south of the border on 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 this type of work. So maybe it's a a message to us to to improve our cooperation. I know there is cooperation, but but uh, organizationally, I think rather than at project level. Yes, well, I, I know, and like this is what well, it's, it's essential, especially where there's shared water bodies. But I know we're involved in the EJP project, which is a big European project, and David Wall's involved in it. And part of that project is looking at harmonization of fertilizer recommendations across countries and neighboring countries. So um, it's definitely something that's talked about. And it, it, we know it's particularly with the environment when we have to deal with the environment and, and border areas and neighboring countries so um yeah it's essential yeah very good i think we've nearly come to all of the the, the questions uh, coming through there pat I, I don't know if is there anything there do you want to add um I, I suppose that that difference between the two different uh sampling methodologies is is uh is, is something that people i suppose we need to try and maybe untangle a little bit maybe the, the going back to the ppm uh, would be a way of, of having a, a common uh, way of just looking at them. But um, Suzanne, it's, it's, it's really important work, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, getting that, that understanding of, 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 of how P performs in the landscape. I think uh, that that subfield sampling, uh, that certainly I'm sure there's a, a project there or some innovative uh, uh, lab somewhere in the world is, is probably working on something like this at, 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 at the moment. But I think it is crucial that we do get that that um, subfield, uh, yeah. or certainly at, at, at uh, uh, an acreage type level, that we can actually say right from below this area that we should be sampling, um, because just to get that level of uh, better resolution. That we had um, a, a speaker from the National Parks and Wildlife with us, a grassland ecologist, uh, speaking to us there uh, not so long ago about the importance of really adjusting RP on these more extensive or certainly these species rich grasslands. So I, I think that that question that came in there more recently, I think is, is particularly important uh, that we we do uh, maybe look at um, from a, a crop requirements perspective, uh, what what uh, the the index says that we should be looking at for those. And I think you've, you've answered that very well. So look, I just want to say thanks very much uh, for all of the time and effort. And uh, we had a few technical issues there yesterday evening, but we, we got we got over them. And uh, we're 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 um, want to build on that relationship with AFBI and also CAFRI, a good relationship with CAFRI, and uh, we're we're really keen to develop that relationship further. So um, thanks again for for joining the, the webinar today. Pass, thanks for helping with questions. And uh, we have Yvonne Maher in the background helping us with our the technical side of things. And I uh, want to thank Andy Boland for uh, the production of the, the, uh, the series. And just remind you that the series is available on the Chagas website if you want to get a copy of the presentation or indeed the recording of today. Or if you want to listen back at, at any of the, the webinars, you can tune into them on the Signpost webinar or Signpost podcast. Uh, which is available on your uh, platform of choice. So with that, we say thanks very much. Enjoy the weekend. And uh, we'll see you next week where we'll be joined by Jack Nolan, who is a senior inspector with the Department of Agriculture. And Jack's going to be giving us an update on the nitrates directive in Ireland. So I, I think that one will be a very interesting one for, for everybody in this country, given the, the fact that uh, the review is um, on the horizon. So thanks very much. And uh, we will... Take, uh, we'll talk to you again next week. Take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagask.ie. And you can also rate, review, and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson, and thanks for listening.